Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jonathan Rosenthal. I'm the Africa editor at The Economist. And it is my absolute enormous pleasure to invite all of you to this, this session um, and to be part of the session, partly because it's, it's, or mainly because it is a, a subject that I'm immensely interested in myself, so I'm looking forward to learning. Uh, it's a subject that uh, we all know is vital uh, to, to the future and the prosperity of, of, of uh, Africa. Um, and this is a panel that has you know, some, of the, some of the best and brightest people on, 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 on the topic, um, with a good mix, as, as the ODI does so well, a good mix of uh, you know, sort of academia, policy, uh, and practitioner and business. So, so, so I'm really looking forward to learning a lot. Um, when one introduces a panel, one's normally meant to sort of have a joke at a time like this. Um, and I'm going to tell you a small and quick story instead, because it's, it's, it's a sort of glass half full, glass half empty, and, uh, but, but, but not funny at all. And, and the stories that we've just been, uh, a few months ago, or we advertised for, a, for a, another Africa correspondent based in Africa, and we, we got this immense uh, flood of 1,500 applications from just about every country in sub-Saharan Africa, certainly every English-speaking country. Uh, and we, we, I mean, that was, on the one hand, incredibly inspiring because, you know, you see these amazing, bright, generally young people uh, showing great talent. Uh, it was equally depressing and the, you then look at their uh, CVs and a lot of them are, are, are sort of not uh, necessarily in jobs that are, are fulfilling their talent. Um, and I suppose the most telling thing for me has been that, that we, we then went to a shortlist and have been interviewing. and. Uh, one of the questions uh, our panel has been asking each of them has just been a, a, a fairly simple question, which is, in 50 years' time, do you think Africa will be rich? Uh, and all of the people we've interviewed, sort of bar one so far, have, have sort of leaned back, thought about it, gone, oh, I'm not so sure, maybe in parts, you know, or, you know, bits of countries or a few countries. And I, and I, and I thought that was quite telling. Um, and only one of those people... Uh, looked back at us as if we were a bit mad, and he said, what are you talking about? Africa is rich. It's, it's rich in people, it's rich in talent, and it's rich in resources. Um, kind of, what kind of question are you asking us? Um, so that brings us back again, and I've taken far too long, but to, 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 to this key question of transformation. We're seeing growth in bits of, bits of the continent. We're seeing growth in certain economies, um, but we're not really seeing the kinds of transformation of economies that we'd, that we'd like to see. We're seeing you know, young people moving into cities and urbanization, but we're then seeing a lot of those young people standing on the side of the road in Lagos selling toilet seats. And, and you sort of have to, have to wonder how many toilet seats to passing motorists buy as a, as a kind of impulse purchase. So, 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 so there really is a sort of transformation of productivity issue. Uh, and with that, I'm going I'm to introduce my, my panel. Uh, uh, so, so we've got Raji uh, on the far side. We've got Dirk who's sitting down. There. I'm, I'm just giving you their speaking order. Uh, Kartik, uh, Her Excellency Yamina, and, and Dominic. Um, and I'm going to ask Raji to, to kick off because she's, she's involved in uh, uh, the work of Gatsby and in, 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 uh, uh, support to the Kenya Markets Trust. Um, and I'd, Raji, I'd like you to just briefly outline sort of what, what that work is and... and what some of the key points are. Sure, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my privilege to be here. Um, I've got roughly about five to seven minutes, so I'll take you quickly through a bit about what Gatsby is all about, what our focus of work is, a bit about our history as well, and where we've arrived to our rich learning that we'd like to share with you guys and take any questions as required. So, growing inequality, rising unemployment and an expanding informal sector kind of casts a shadow on the uh, impressive growth rates of some of the African countries. Now, this story of Africa um, is testimony to the fact that growth by itself, without structural changes, does not actually move the needle of development. Um, Gatsby is a foundation we focus on not just growing in key sectors, but on actually aiding the process of transformation. Gatsby has a long history of engagement in East Africa. I mean, our origins date back to 1985, 
when, when we were originally mostly involved in agricultural research, dissemination and building of local institutions. Over time, we experimented with a number of tools, techniques. We even positioned ourselves differently in varying contexts. And through this journey spanning three decades, uh, our thinking and approach has evolved and are now focused on sectors as an important component of economic transformation, driving productivity shifts and value creation. Today, Gatsby's footprint spans 10 sectors across four countries in East Africa. <coughs> now, this breadth of work in one region allows us to compare, contrast experiences, assess common elements across varying contexts, and learn from what works. As a private foundation, I mean, we have freedom, and we're not limited by tools, techniques, nor are we dogmatic about theoretical approaches. We are pragmatic, we are flexible, and we take a long-term perspective. We also draw on our extensive local networks to achieve, um, to kind of shift the development agenda. Now, drawing on learnings from our own experiences and from alternative approaches in private sector development, Gatsby takes a holistic view of sectors, looking not just at policy changes or broad brush enabling environment reforms. We look at demand drivers, firm capabilities, industry structure, a whole gamut of things, focusing on structural changes alongside tackling inefficiencies in a sector. Sector transformation is not just about tackling inefficiencies in the sector, and it's not about achieving incremental gains or creating pockets of change. It really is about addressing key binding constraints that hold sectors back at a sector level and introducing disruptive innovations that can open up opportunities for value creation and productivity shifts the outcomes of which will actually transcend boundaries of sectors. Sector transformation is also not just growth. It is a process by which we create a step change in scale, driven by competitive, inclusive, and resilient growth. At Gatsby, we have an explicit focus on resilient growth. Our experience is that when you go back five to 10 years after development programs and initiatives have happened, quite often, the gains that have happened in sectors or in value chains have receded or have collapsed. This may be due to a number of reasons. I mean, changing demand conditions or different political favors or capture of vested interest. But it, we have, we are therefore focused on actually building the right capabilities, introducing dynamism to ensure that sectors are able to innovate, evolve and adapt to those changing conditions. And that's resilience for us growth that lasts for a long time. While private sector is key to growth, almost across the board, transformation has involved good leadership and commitment from governments. The role of political will and commitment cannot be overstated, and some of our less successful initiatives have been victims to this. For a process of transformation, a sector needs to secure the conditions for competitive, inclusive, and resilient growth. Gatsby has drawn on existing growth and competitive models to develop our own sector conditions framework. It ref this, this is a cornerstone of our approach. It reflects the holistic view we take of a sector and the change required for resilient growth. There are some handouts in ODI and the receptions, please feel free to take that and have a look at it. We have worked with ODI over the last year almost to actually look at historic lessons on how transformation has happened in sectors, particularly in textiles. And this research has helped us to adjust our sector conditions framework. And happy to take questions on it, but that's just a brief teaser on what we are about. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. I've got a few. Um, 
Turk, I'd like to I'd like to bring you, and I, I, I should imagine that Turk probably needs uh, very little introduction uh, in, in this audience. But uh, principal research fellow, head of uh, the International Economic Development Group, it goes on. Um, he's published widely. He knows what he's talking about, and he's going to talk to us about um, economic transformation at the sector level. Thanks, Turk. Do you want Do you want to do it from there, or should I? Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the introduction. Uh, you mentioned that I, I know what I'm talking about. I think I sh that's probably because I've talked to you uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and have learned uh, learned from you. Um, so also thank you, Raji, for that int introduction. And uh, sort of ODI has had a, a learning partnership with um, uh, with the Gatsby around uh, economic transformation. And I'm really pleased that there's there are so many of you have come here to. Um, uh, to come to discuss economic transformation because it is such a crucial topic in in development. It's such a crucial topic to uh, to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. We know that um, it's so important to create jobs. You need transformation for this. Uh, there are huge demographic challenges uh, coming in a range of countries that we're looking at, including uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and also, um, of course, India as well, but has huge demographic uh, challenges. And uh, so we need to create jobs. Uh, governments need to create jobs. The private sector, above all, needs to create jobs to to to, uh, um, to think about uh, the, the labor market entrants that are, that are coming. Um, for this, we need productive capabilities. We need transformed uh, economies. So this is a, a core topic. I think that it's also fair to say that, uh, that a range of uh, African countries and the AU collectively are, have now uh, put visions in place uh, that recognize the transformation challenges. So there are visions in Tanzania, there are visions in, in other countries. There's the AU 2063 agenda that really talks about transformation, industrialization uh, as a way, way in. Yet what we're often seeing uh, or failing to see uh, uh, is practical approaches to actually uh, achieve this. And there are lots of th issues that stand in the way. Um, capacities, uh, government capacities could be uh, standing in the way. Um, there are ideas that may uh, stand in the way. There might be certain ideologies or uh, that, that may stand in the way. And this is not necessarily an issue just for African countries. I mean, if the UK, you can also uh, think about it, of course. But it is still also the case in, in a range of countries that if you think you want to transform, you want to industrialize your economy, you want to move from 10% uh, of uh, GDP for manufacturing to 20% uh, of manufacturing in, in, in GDP uh, in, in five to 10 years, well, you know that that's going to be almost near impossible. And if you then also see that the approaches that are sometimes taken is about, yeah, let's develop a whole sector in five years' time, it's just not feasible. And I think, therefore, it's really important to, to think what is practically, practically uh, possible. And that uh, has been sort of our, our uh, motivation behind our thinking about economic transformation more generally over the last four years. And we did a lot of that in partnership with the Department for International Development. But we've now moved bit more down in the sector level and with the Gatsby. And, and I think we both need to sort of recognize the role of Gatsby and some of the other donors, including DFID as well, to really think about a transformation. There are still a lot of other donors that don't really have economic transformation as a, um, um, uh, as, as a core aspect of their uh, development uh, offer. And um, so if we go down uh, to level, then uh, we, we do that because we, we realize that it's not just the uh, regulatory framework that is important. So if you look at national development 10, 15 years ago, um, um, World Bank would, would have said, uh, get the investment climate right, uh, and the rest will follow. And that's been, uh, of course, investment climate regulatory frameworks are important. I'm not saying that, but that on its own isn't, isn't enough. There's lots of more detailed work that, uh, that needs to be done. And it's really important to think more at a targeted level and that you are helping uh, countries in an opportunistic level to solve their problems, their, inv their investor problems um, to, uh, to transformation that need to be solved. And so moving away from a sort of a regulatory framework driven transformation approach to a more problem driven uh, approach that recognizes the problems of the private sector is sort of uh, the building markets approach, investment led approach, and that I think is really, really important. So what we set out to do in a, in a paper, and you may have seen that um, either on our website or you can um, uh, get a copy here, is to look at six cases of uh, successful cases and five failures of transformation at sector level. 
um, and uh, this ranges from um, Eth Ethiopian Airlines as successors, automotive industry in South Africa, uh, Coco Bot in Ghana, Indonesia's Staple Food, Garments in Bangladesh, sector strategies in Mauritius as, as uh, successors, and perhaps cashew nuts, pineapples in Ghana, uh, maize subsidy in, in, in Malawi, uh, the rights initiative of Kikwet in Tanzania and Malaysia's faltering manufacturing sector as, as, um, as failures. And then we derive six factors that have been important at the sector level to make these uh, sectors um, transform. And that distinguishes from, from um, uh, less well uh, um, uh, or from, from failures. First of all, um, so there are two parts. So what is economics and there's politics. Uh, the first f factor is about economics. So making that's crucial. Um, you need to make sure you identify the opportunities well, uh, whether that is trade preferences in, uh, 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 in, in, for example, Bangladesh that have uh, led to, to a range of, um, to, to, the, to, the, to, uh, to the growth in the garment sector there, whether it's, uh, well, also Agawa preferences in Kenya, for example, or whether it is tapping into the Chinese market for flights from, uh, for, from China to, to, to Africa for Ethiopian Airlines. It's being there at the right time, identifying those opportunities. The economics are still very pretty important. But um, there have been cases where the, the, these, these opportunities have been identified correctly, um, uh, but, uh, um, uh, and you build on, on, on your, your, your most uh, uh, um, abundant resource, whether it's labor, um, you, but the, the sector may not have worked um, that well. And so there's a lot of politics involved in, uh, in this, and I think that's important to, to mention about transformation. And so we have five other factors that I mentioned briefly now, and maybe one or two examples of these. So the five other factors are, that are really important for, uh, for transformation at the sector level are conducive political economic conditions, credible commitments to investors, thirdly, reasonably good provision of public goods, uh, fourthly, specific efforts to tackle investment coordination problems. And fifthly, uh, taking advantage of moments of unusual opportunity. And, um, and this work, uh, where we've looked at these two politics, is also based on work by David Booth and uh, Neil Belchin uh, when, the, when, uh, uh, when he was at ODI. Um, so thinking a bit about sort of this uh, political economy situation, so we would say, would argue that perhaps the political economy relations were, uh, were a bit more conducive and the commitments were a bit stronger in cases such as Ethiopian Airlines or uh, South African automobiles, or uh, in the case of Mauritius, where, when they moved up uh, the, the sectors from sugar to textiles, garments, and, um, and, um, um, and then to other, to other sectors. Um, and there's also been reasonably good provision of public goods, uh, targeted perhaps in the case of South Africa, maybe some ports and some um, industrial parks around uh, automotive of industries. Um, but I think there, the politics has worked less well in some other cases. So if you think a bit about sort of the um, Malawi, Malawi um, uh, subsidy, for, subsidies for, uh, for maize example, is where initially um, it was well identified and there was strong uh, political backing for this, um, and it did have a bit of a supply response. It wasn't followed up uh, later on, uh, so Matarika didn't really uh, follow that up later on in his second term, and that, that, that backing waned. Uh, s similarly with the Kikwete uh, Vice Initiative, uh, there was some uh, uh, response, supply response, um, but it was, uh, um, and, and there were certain measures that were put in place. Um, uh, you can talk a bit about whether they were appropriate or not, but at least these, these were put in place. And some was supply response and rise, but it was undermined, and it was undermined by smuggling in particular. And, um, and so the powerful players uh, were undermining the efforts to, uh, to, uh, to support um, uh, the sector, and therefore the government couldn't provide a, a credible uh, uh, co commitment. In terms of reasonably good provision of public goods, um, similarly, the um, sort of the uh, Malawi didn't help. There were bad roads, uh, uh, lack of irrigation in Tanzania, vis-a-vis, -vis, as you mentioned, some of the industrial parks and the port infrastructure in uh, in, in South Africa, is uh, is really um, really important. Um, so, in terms of, um, of of lessons from this, is that yes, it's important to. 
uh, go down the sector level. And we've, we identify so many examples where lots of things are actually happening at the targeted sector level. So you should not be thinking only about, uh, about country level transformation. You need to more practically think about uh, moving down to the sector level where you can think about coordination of, of different players and, um, and think about the economic opportunities that exist working with investors. And I hope to, to hear more on that as well, of course, uh, in, uh, on this. But, but, um, but secondly, what is really important is, is credible commitment from, from, from uh, government. Uh, it's consistently being able to follow up certain policies. It's around providing public goods to come with, uh, with this. And there are so many examples where, where that has failed. So where the economic opportunities were good, but uh, where the consistent follow-up has failed. And I think that's where a, a lot of this, we need to uh, think much more through about the political economy um, of, of opportunities at, um, at the sector level. Um, so change can happen if we need to move down to the sector level. Certain sectors are, uh, are moving, um, um, but there are huge challenges around. And, um, and I think we probably can talk, uh, the panel can talk internally uh, uh, about this as well, because we've got government and, 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 and business players on this. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dirk. Um, so, I th so I think we've, we've sort of gone from... from uh, you know, broader overviews into the need to be sort of quite sector specific and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, country specific. And, and, and I think this is a good time to bring in uh, Kartik because uh, he, he works for the uh, Tony Blair Global Institute uh, and advises, uh, among other things, the, the government of Ethiopia on its uh, industrialization and, and economic strategy. So, Kartik. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks to uh, ODI for hosting this event. Um, toward the end of last year, uh, a colleague at TBI, Jonathan Said, um, Linda Calabrese at uh, ODI and myself uh, wrote a report um, based on our experience researching and working with governments in East Africa on economic transformation. Um, and I think actually some of our learnings echo a lot of what Dirk, uh, Dirk just spoke about. So, you know, what we've seen in, in the region is that, you know, countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, you name it, um, all have ambitions to export to global markets, become regional hubs for various sectors, uh, the good news is that they've, they've all made quite a lot of strides on this front in terms of kick-starting sector development efforts, um, attracting investment, and, and driving growth. Um, our observation, however, is that much of the growth that they've achieved has not been in job-creating high-value sectors, so things like agro-industry, manufacturing, tradable services. Rather, they've come, it's come largely from sectors like mining, construction, and non-tradable services. So, you know, there, there remains an urgent need for, for jobs in these countries. And one of the most common asks from the job-creating private sector is, um, at least in our experience, is policy coherence and, and consistency from, from government. Um, this, this is critical because it enables firms to plan their investments uh, more thoroughly and to better anticipate and manage risks. So um, one of the most important issues that we've seen with respect to policy coherence is that um, it is, is sort of these disconnects between a few different areas of, of, of policy. So um, trade policy, um, investment and investment promotion, and sector development. So in, in our report, what we do is we go through a number of different examples from various countries <coughs> in the region to, to sort of talk about where there might be some shortcomings in terms of joining up these different areas of of policy and implementation that government um, ultimately has to be in charge of. Um, I, I won't go through any of the specific examples for, um, um, for, for time purposes, but um, w you know, we have copies of the report outside and I'm happy to talk more about it. But um, you know, essentially in the end, what, what we, what the question that we're trying to ask is you know, how can governments in, in East Africa construct sort of these missing links between these, these three areas of policy that I mentioned. Um, you know, I don't have time to set out in detail exactly what we say, but I'll highlight two, two points that we try to make. First is that we feel that um, governments can go further in identifying and designating a few promising sectors or, or value chains as a policy anchor that can fo focus the attention of different parts of government. So this is to, to Dirk's point that he just made. Um, you know, this enables champions of uh, economic transformation in government to clearly communicate their priorities and set a direction that um, the rest of government and importantly um, investors can, can follow. Um, and it also 
this sort of sector prioritization can also bring the politics um, closer to home, so to speak. So, you know, political economy invest the political economy dynamics and vested interests are sector specific, right? And so they need to be understand understood in the context of specific sectors. And so that's why you know having sectoral focus can be can be quite important. Um, the second point that we try to make is that um, you know we've seen that establishing more effective coordination mechanisms um, can help governments to to quell overlapping mandates and turf battles that are common among different government agencies um, that are charged with you know overseeing these different areas of areas of policy. So you know there's no one size fits all approach in terms of the 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 structure or, or form of a coordination mechanism. Um, you know there are some learnings that we've taken from from other countries that have that have been able to do this quite well. So, um, you know, characteristics like having authorization and uh, being able to convene, um, you know, different parts of government through high-level political leadership, having the awareness and space to balance political realities with um, economic robustness, and uh, establishing focused engagement with, with the private sector in priority sectors. Um, the, the key, ultimately, no matter what form a coordination mechanism takes, is that um, it needs to promote co-design and, importantly, co-implementation of policies across the different areas that I mentioned, trade, investment, and, and sector development. So, in, you know, in the end, our aim with this work was to sort of add to the growing course of voices advocating for deeper economic transformation in the region by highlighting what's happening on the ground based on our experience working with governments. Um, and to, to propose some sort of tangible ideas that governments can take forward um, um, in its pursuit of uh, economic transformation. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's now also with great pleasure that, I, that, I, that I'm going to introduce Yamina. Um, as many of you would know, uh, if you travel around the continent and say sort of which country uh, by the sort of textbook definition, ought to be ought to be struggling the most. It's landlocked. It's got sort of bad neighbours. It's in a you know. Uh, you, you would say Rwanda, Rwanda, and you then say to most African leaders or, or business people, which country do you think is doing the best job of of, of, of organising itself? And it is Rwanda. So um, uh, there are certainly certainly lessons to be learned. From Thank you, Chair. Um, well, Rwanda. If I go back 25 years ago, we were just coming out of a genocide, um, counting more than a million dead. And, and in as much as we, we rightly focus on, on that, the loss of human lives, there was also something equally disturbing that was taking place, which was we had a stagnated economy that had shrunk by 50%. We had a 64% inflation rate we had a 78% poverty rate. And so that was 25 years ago. The period that followed was obviously emerging from a post-conflict um, period, uh, rebuilding the economy, healing the population. And then um, I would say in the last 10, 15 years, we started really focusing on the next stage of our economic uh, growth which then pushed us to um, look and think for a transformative shift of our economy. And it's no secret um, what we've heard from the colleagues, we focused on reducing our trade deficit. Um, you said it, we're a landlocked country, a small country, um, you know, we had everything going against us on top of recovering from a genocide. But we said, if we then decide to look at export and look at what we can actually export and really add value to anything that is leaving the country. Because one of the challenges that Africa in general has suffered from has been we export, yes. Africa exports. Everything leaves the continent. But the value of what is leaving the continent is impoverishing the continent. Because in essence, anything coming out of Africa that is non-processed, um, including tea and coffee and, and everything else, uh, I'm not even talking about minerals here, 
but it is going to enrich everybody else. But when you look at the actual dollar value that is staying on the continent, it is very little. And it is only one, when one look at value addition that we will create the kind of jobs, the, 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 the high value jobs that will take us forward um, and then reduce em employment, but also give us what we need in terms of um, uh, value. So, so Rwanda decided to do just that, uh, increase our export, and we focused on five objectives. One, attain structural shift in export to high value goods and services. Um, it, it, it is still hard because I think we, he we heard capacity building is a challenge and everything to go from transformation of, of a raw material to a high value is in itself a very expensive um, endeavor. But, but we have hope and we, we all also know that that's our only way forward. Um, and so we are, we're focusing a lot of attention on just that. Uh, creating productive jobs, of course, that goes without saying, because if we want to export high value goods, we will need high value productive jobs to ensure that. We also are fast tracking growth of Rwandan economic champions. So those who have shown leadership in, in this field are being encouraged further. This is, this is the private sector. We're working closely with them. Government is looking at regulations and uh, all we heard. How, how do we discuss further with the private sector to ensure that they are supported and facilitated? We are doing that. And as we speak, we're the most competitive, um, or second most competitive economy in Africa. Um, we are hoping to maintain that, that, uh, that level. Um, we have reformed greatly. Uh, we're, I think, the most reformed economy in the, um, in the history of the World Bank doing business report. Um, and that is by joining hands with the private sector in understanding what their requirements are so that we move forward and facilitate uh, what they have to produce. One thing that we're also doing is um, hoping to become a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship. Because in as much as we talk about creating employment, there's only much one can create. We also need to ensure that entrepreneurship is equally important and equally facilitated as we move forward. And one way is to encourage innovation. Um, we also are positioning ourselves as a proof of concept country, which would, in essence, um, welcome those entrepreneurs who have ideas and give them a platform to prove their concept in Rwanda. Uh, we facilitate them. We are more flexible than many other countries in terms of regulation. And then they can grow. Once they've proven their concept in Rwanda, they can grow outside of the, the country and explore other markets. I have a few examples. Uh, one of them is Zipline. I think some of you have heard of this uh, drone delivery uh, service that um, delivers uh, vaccines and bloods to uh, rural and hard to reach areas. They've proved proven their concept in Rwanda, and they have now ex uh, expanded to, I think, two or three other countries in Africa. So, so we're looking at, at in many ways. So it's, it's, it's the export, is the innovation hub, it is the constant engagement with the private sector that will take us forward. But on the export, I wanted to just mention, in the few minutes I've left, I'm left with there are things the country can do, and there are things the global community needs to do. When you look at tariffs, for example, um, it's well and good for Rwanda as a country to want to export high-value goods. But then you are taxed heavily when, when the goods are being sent to. So I think as, as we explore ways for us to unburden those countries that are looking at you know, enhancing their economies, 
there is a global conversation to be held where the, the, the focus on welcoming raw materials is, is, is diminished at the global stage. It, it is a difficult conversation, but I think it's a conversation to be held if indeed we are um, interesting, interested in, in, in creating the high value <laughs> jobs that Africa needs. Um, we also have uh, Rwanda Air, our airline, that is um, starting to grow and we, I think, are at 25 destinations now. We, has, we started by connecting Africa because you all know that um, five years ago to go from Libreville to Brazzaville, which, are, which is a 45 minute flight, one needed to go to Paris and back down. It's insane, but that, that was a situation um, um, in Africa. So we started looking at those very quick wins and we've made good inroads and um, we have now emerged out of Africa, we are flying into Gatwick. I hope some of you fly Rwanda Air. We are connected um, through India and China as well. And China is also, because of the market, we also, um, through Alibaba, um, that created the electronic world trade platform, Rwanda has, um, has been given an opportunity to sell directly to the Chinese market without going through the middle uh, men. Which, which has also given more to the farmers that are selling the coffees and teas. The value now is, the, the, the opportunity now is not to sell the raw materials, is to emerge and, and sell and export um, high value goods that will give us the dollars that we need. So those are the few comments I have for now and I'm willing to take some questions, thank you. Great, thank you. I think there'll be, once again, lots to discuss. Um, I, I suppose we, we, we've heard some of the theory, we've heard some of the politics and, and, and the policy, and now we get down to the, uh, the difficult stuff of, of doing. And, and Dominic uh, uh, is a serial entrepreneur who has, has sort of is doing, has done uh, uh, investments in, in uh, textiles in, in Africa, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what one has to do. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank you to the ODI for hosting this event today on transformation in Africa. Um, I established Hella Clothing about six years ago. It's a company I took over in Sri Lanka, manufacturing predominantly for the UK high street, uh, children's wear school uniforms. Had about three factories, a couple of thousand employees. It was clear the market was changing in, in Europe and the UK in particular, but also price pressures, sensitivities, um, rapid wage increase in Sri Lanka, a direction from the government to uh, develop tourism and other industries, some with success. And we have $500 million airports mothballed in the south of Sri Lanka currently. Um, but it was clear that we, we had to grow domestically in Sri Lanka into other categories, but also look beyond the shores. Um, as an entrepreneur, I look for those opportunities, but also look to protect the business, the investment, and the people within that organization. Our American business was growing considerably, but there was a lot of noise, the amount of duty of uh, landed goods into the US from Sri Lanka and other countries. Import duties uh, at the time from Sri Lanka, and I still believe maintain, are around up to 32%. So if you're a customer spending $100 million with myself, you are looking up to a $32 million uh, import duty tax bill when it lands. I wanted to see how we could become somewhat trade war proof as a business, but also have those first mover advantages. A number of Sri Lankan businesses were invested into Bangladesh. I never liked to be the last to the party. Uh, a number of people were looking at Vietnam. It was already flooded by a number of Chinese manufacturers moving production where it's expensive in southern China into Vietnam and Cambodia. What we saw with Ethiopia and Kenya was the ability to create a business which was effectively duty-free to 95% of the world. Not only duty-free to 95% of the world, a very um, de-risked in the sense of raw materials. So I'm not sure how familiar you all are on the details of Goa, 
but currently, and I'll come on to some points on this in a minute, but currently we buy our raw materials from China. We could even buy the finest wools and levers from Italy. We cut that material in Ethiopia or Kenya, we sew it, we put a label on it, we package it, and we send it to the US duty free. So that has enabled our customers to experience significant savings and allowed countries like Kenya and Ethiopia to rapidly grow their export markets of garments. So we currently now have, uh, after two years of being present in East Africa, uh, two facilities in Ethiopia in a region called uh, Hawassa, uh, where we employ almost 1,500 people. And then we have a, another world-class facility in Ati River, which is about 20 minutes outside of Nairobi, where we're employing almost 6,000 people. This has been achieved in less than three years. Our combined export values a year are in excess of $50 million. We account for, I would say, in excess of 15% of garment exports from Kenya, probably 90% of women's underwear exports from Ethiopia. But we've done this by putting people first. We have childcare facilities at our uh, operation in Kenya. Mothers that are still uh, breastfeeding and nursing are able to, in their lunch breaks or so should it be during their shifts, are able to come to the childcare facilities and breastfeed. We provide free food for all of our workers, which sadly became um, a bit of a political issue because no other factories in Kenya provided in our sector free food to their workers, which cr created some disruption. But one thing I know is that if I turn up to work hungry, I'm not going to be effective. So why should I expect the best from my colleagues when I'm not providing the best environment for them. We, uh, we provide water to the communities, and some of you might say that's an obvious, but in some of the areas where we operate, there are water mafias controlling the water. Sexual health services um, are provided. We, we screen for uh, various uh, cancers. Smear tests are provided within our facilities. We have relationships with the local women's hospitals to, to refer for cancer care and treatment. We, I wouldn't say we go above and beyond. We do what we should be doing as a business. If other businesses that you work with or come across are not acting with the same principles, I question are these businesses that you should be engaging with. So we've become recognised for our work. We have been recognised by the Secretary of State, Penny Morden, and the ODI have spent time uh, within uh, our operations seeing and understanding the work that we do. It hasn't been challenge-free, though. And the, the, but as an entrepreneur, we prepare for that. We know that Ethiopia is landlocked. We know there are issues at the port of Djibouti. We know that the Kenyan government is under massive pressure from the Chinese investors around Mombasa and the SDR. We prepare ourselves for that. We brace for that. I've lived in Uganda. I've had the huge privilege of living in Uganda as well, uh, in hand-to-mouth and subsistence communities. And I've seen firsthand what is required and how we can help embrace, engage, and create those bonds where we can make a difference. In Ethiopia, I, I think it would be fair to say we're one of the few companies making a profit because of that engagement with community and people, but also our strategy. We haven't gone to Ethiopia looking to make any product and every product as cheap as possible. In fact, our manufacturing costs are on par with Sri Lanka, potentially more. But because of the landed savings, the customers are, are, are still willing to pay that additional cost on the FOB. As we invest and as we invest further, and as I continue to challenge the morals and ethics of the work we do, it is important that we are not here just taking people from subsistence communities and into the capital system, but allowing people to break that cycle of poverty and grow as individuals within the opportunities that are being created. And picking up on the, the points of Her Excellency and, uh, and, and, and Kartik, policies, consistency of policy is key. So for example, in Kenya, they introduced an 18% wage hike, but had that applied retrospectively. And a lot of companies have closed their books by April, May 1st, you're told your salaries are going up 18%, but you've got to backdate them nine months. Our costings, the work we do, the investments we make with our people are based around policy and, and, and local wage knowledge. So it's very difficult and in, in fact, extremely undermining to organisations where a government can move you from a profit to a loss overnight. It is uh, also, I think, picking up on Her Excellency's points of creating that value on the continent. We, I speak about the revenues that we do in Africa. Let's assume 
for argument's sake, it's $10 million of exports a year. When we receive that order, we will send at least 6 to $7 million straight away to China, India, Pakistan. So ultimately, even though the bill of ladings and the GDP numbers that you see and that were reported on by the World Bank and various economic forums, that cash is not remaining in the country. The value is not staying in, in, in Kenya or Ethiopia. The value is leaving the day the order is received. So we might ship $10 million of goods, but the beneficiaries are not necessarily Kenya and Ethiopia. And this is something that um, I am pushing <laughs> constantly on for governments to take ownership and control of those flows of funds, but also a more cohesive and collaborative uh, approach to supply chain and bringing the value add at the same time as you bring the low cost elements of the investments. And I, I will finish by saying there is huge opportunity. I'm honoured to be part of the most exciting continent being Africa. But if my customers are there because of a goa, we ne really need to up our game because a goa is potentially gone in 2024, 2025. Rwanda has actually made that step forwards in making itself competitive. Uh, and, and has exited, uh, I think, a go under the garments, but I stand corrected. But we need to move quickly. Ethiopia needs to become competitive now, because if it's not competitive within five years' time, it's going to be very expensive and people will stop buying. Same goes for Kenya. So as we talk about economic transformation in Africa, time is of the essence, but also in capturing that value is key Otherwise, the economic transformation in Africa will remain to be on paper and not be in reality. Thank you, Jonathan. Great. Thank you very much. I think that was, that was a fascinating sort of uh, nuts and bolts of, of how difficult it is. Uh, and I'm going to kick off on that because you've uh, spoken about some of the problems in a sector that, that, that in fact, is one of the more successful sectors. Uh, we've also had a discussion about the importance of, of kind of choosing and, and getting the sectors right up front. And I... I'm going to throw this open to the panel, but, but we've seen a long history of, of, of governments doing a bad job at, at picking winners, whether it's individual firms or, or whether it's, it's sort of sector strategies. Now, who'd like to volunteer first on, on, on what are some of the key, kind of key learnings and lessons as to, as to how one even identifies that sector before devoting resources to it? No volunteers? <laughs> I mean, just in terms of, is it governments picking them? Is it, is it just picking the right sectors? So to ensure that we have, we achieve economic transformation, yes, there are a couple of criteria that we probably need to bear in mind while picking which sectors to grow, starting with, do sectors have a comparative advantage to allow them to grow? Maybe one. And it's probably best place for the politics of the country to determine whether that change is even feasible. Does the political economy allow for those changes, for sure? Uh, and if these, and are they, will the gains that accrue from those changes in the sector benefit a lot of people? Probably these three things together should point to a direction of which sectors a country should pick in terms of how it grows. You spoke earlier about some of the historical work that you've done, some of the, some of the lessons, and I... And I uh, I just wondered if you could give an example or two. I know Dirk went through some of the sectors that have been successes or failures, but let's take it a step back. Have you got you know, an example or two of, of uh, you know, investments or, or, or policies that have just gone in the wrong direction from the start? Or, or have gone in the right direction? I mean, what, what, what have been sort of what's one success, one failure? Work that... Um, it may not be Dirk's work, but it's... Uh, uh, if, if we're saying right up front, one of the one of the key issues is getting the sector right. Have you got a, you know besides textiles? Have you got a, an, another example or two of of, of sec, you know countries uh, that have that have got got it right up front and, and, and some that have perhaps made some mistakes? So there are numerous examples probably across the globe where. Where, sec where countries have got them right and occasionally wrong as well. Mm -hmm. So like in Tanzania and Rowan, we work, Gatsby has worked in the cotton sector for a while. Um, now it's not, it's been a very politicized sector for sure, but in terms of whether the government has put in the right kind of uh, commitment, has the commitment to make that sector grow is questionable in terms of what they've done. Um, 
was it the right sector to choose from? Yes, depending on the number of people who are dependent on it and the fact that at one point that sector was competitive and could be over time. Yes, it probably is the right sector. But has that converted into gains? The answer is probably no. Um, so yes, it's, it's a lot of factors that can, needs to come together to make it work. But in terms of who chooses it, is it external parties like ourselves or is it the government themselves? But it works best when the governments have got the politics and the economics right from the start to make the right choice. Um, Chile is a good example where they have chosen some sectors. I mean, Foundation Chile is an organization that helps the government, works with the government to actually do that well, right from the point of identifying comparative advantages, making sure that all the right framework for investment is there. Dirk, uh, I'm going to bring you in. And do you want to sit here and shall I stand there? Fine. Is that? Um, I, I think it's uh, in this debate we move a lot from. So we heard, hear a lot about pick, <laughs> picking winners, but I, I talk more about creating the conditions for winners. And I, I learned it from Sanjay Lal uh, about 20 years ago when I started here at ODI. Um, and uh, in that approach, I think we, we need to learn a lot from the Hella, the Hella clothing firm, for example, and is working with, uh, with firms and, uh, and, and leaders in particular sectors to say, well, actually, what does it take to be successful in a particular uh, country? If there is some uh, a, a business there that is operating, has problems, we need to think about uh, addressing those problems. And, and now I think what I'm hearing now is, for example, that 60, 70 percent of, of, of what you're exporting from Kenya is imported. So why, why is, does that have to be the case? Is there something that can be done about that um, and I uh, so um, uh, there are particular elements from garments that could be produced in Kenya as well whether it is uh, elastic bands for the, for the speedos where it's the buttons or whatever it is and, and things like that and I was also in Bangladesh just two weeks ago visiting a, a, a firm um, or, or a factory and there I heard that they were uh, importing uh, half their uh, materials and half was produced locally. So they've gone a, 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 a bit f further than perhaps uh, Kenya has. And I think um, so learning across and thinking about the conditions uh, that can help to cre uh, create more winners uh, and, and suppliers to um, to uh, to Hella, for example, uh, that that will be a good way, and it's that support support that we we need to see uh, from uh, from governments, and that consistent support, that commitment that they are willing to help out. Um, uh, we had. Um, uh, uh, Helen High here uh, some time ago, uh, uh, talking fr fr from uh, on her, sh her shoe factory in Ethiopia at the time, and she was saying, "Well, I've got the, the mobile phone numbers of all the ministers in, uh, 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 available and on my mobile, and I, if I've got a problem, I can I, I can uh, I can get a, a response uh, in, uh, in 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 little time." Well, not all the of course all the problems have been solved as we we hear, but I think that it's it, that change of attitude in sort of not not necessarily owning a whole sector, as it was the case in the 60s and 70s, not necessarily not doing anything at all uh, or standing in the way, but actually having facilitating this. I think that's what we now uh, want to mean by picking winners or creating the conditions for winners. I think that's facilitation. That's what we really want to see. And that's where the politics comes in uh, uh, a lot as well. And, and Jack, while you're there, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep you for another second, which is just uh, what role do, do, do sort of DFIs and, and, and policy organizations like, you know, such as yourself and, and other outsiders play in assisting uh, uh, in, the, in the development of these sectors and, 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 and sort of what are some of the mistakes that they may have been making? Um, I think, I mean, transformation, as I mentioned, is, a, is, is not something that can be solved by one person, one uh, particular type of organization on his or her, her, her own. Um, it, this is a collective uh, responsibility. And uh, you mentioned DFIs. I think two, three years ago, we had the, the chairman uh, of CDC and also a minister launching the five-year strategy. And so, for example, CDC, we're actively talking about developing sectors. Um, we had a workshop earlier this morning as well, where also we had discussion with the Gatsby and, uh, and, and the Tony Blair Institute, where we're really thinking about um, is there a role for coordination, and uh, that the donors are very much strategic? They they want to uh, they are idealistic, strategic, and want to have uh, achieve certain things. Planners, uh, then you've got the business and the DFIs are more transactional um, in, in nature, thinking about spotting opportunities, individual opportunities, and we'd like to bring those together, uh, and, and and so that together we we can facilitate, and that can't be done at country level. 
uh, as a whole. It needs to be done at a targeted level, thinking about where are the opportunities, uh, where where are the the, uh, the the business opportunities, so investor-led thinking about it, and then building around inv investment a certain ecosystem uh, of support, of course, led by by country governments uh, and their support uh, uh, institutions. Right, thanks. Kartik, yes. You, yeah, you look as if you've got a lot. On both of these points, Please. potentially. So um, on, on your question about sort of uh, bad experiences in the past with picking winners and how to pick sectors, so, um, you know, you asked us to be a bit provocative earlier, so I'll, I'll try to answer that challenge. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in some sense that it was, all, it was always a bit of a, an illusion to, to think that when government sort of tries to do something that it's fully neutral across all sectors. You know, I mean, when, if you take an infrastructure investment, building a road or building a power station somewhere, I mean, you have to choose where it's happening, where you're going to build it, and by definition, that'll, uh, you know, benefit, you know, firms in that area or, or farmers or whoever in that area versus people in another area, right? So there's, there's sort of an implicit choice that governments are making whenever they intervene and, um, you know, economically speaking. So, um, you know, that's just... The reality. So I, I think picking up on a couple of things that Raji said. First is that you know government having a clear vision, I think, is important. You know, it, picking sectors is can sometimes be quite challenging, and um, you're not always going to get it right. But um, to maximize your chance, government sort of, as Dirk was saying, has to be sort of in the driver's seat and and have sort of broad-based commitment and engagement with private sector to to sort of. Um, you know, raise the chances that any given sector will actually turn out turn out to be a good one. Um, second on that point is around politics. So I think, um, you know, in, in the past, a lot of the bad experiences with picking winners have, have, has in part come down to a misunderstanding or, or, a, um, or, or a sort of a lack of acknowledgement of the, the critical influence of political economy and, and the way in which sectors operate. And so using that as a starting point, or, or at least using it as sort of a, a lens alongside the economic lens to, to determine where to focus, which sectors to focus on, I think would be quite important. Um, on, on the point about sort of external actors, just, just one thing to say there. So, um, you know, what we've seen working with governments, uh, a number of different governments in Africa is that, you know, external actors could, could um, do a bit better on a couple of fronts. One is on, on fragmentation. So oftentimes they're, you know, they're working with specific parts of government, not really, join, not really working in a joined up way, and not necessarily focused on the things that you know, government would ideally want them to focus on. The second bit is around what um, Dominic was saying, which is that you know, a lot of um, what makes or breaks sort of the, the ability of firms like his to, to succeed is, comes down to the details. And, and that's about sort of government being able to solve very specific problems at very specific points in time. And so implementation, I think, is, is really a critical point here that, um, that external um, actors could, could um, do well to, to focus a bit more on. Great, great. Um, the, the question, just c coming back again to sort of DFIs, donor finance, one has seen quite a lot of investment going in. One is seeing that sometimes that is being driven by uh, people making decisions, sitting here in London and the like. Um, and I'm just quite keen to get both your views and, and, and Excellency, your view as to, as to uh, so who should really be driving that? Is it, is it the recipient countries who are saying these are the, these are the you know, opportunities we're identifying and, and this is where we want to prioritize our, our investment? or, or, or or, or essentially, does one take a view that says kind of any investment is good, and if someone in London wants to uh, put money into, you know, I don't know, a packaging plant, that's fine. Who who should call the shots? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I, I think it's what what I heard, um, and I agree with is a government has got to have a vision, and then interested parties and development <coughs> partners should fit and feed that vision. Otherwise, you're, 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 you're basically moving and walking blindly. Uh, because today it could be one investor who has one uh, interest, and tomorrow it's a development partner who has their own interest. So I think Africa is not, should not be the, the exception here. 
every other country has a vision. Um, and so you are invited to feed into that vision. Having said that, a vision also needs life. And the, the life then becomes from the private sector, from those who will implement, as we've heard, the private sector will redirect sometimes even regulation. But it has to, the, the, basis, the baseline has to be there, and the baseline has got to come from, from the custodian of, of the land, which, which is government, in, in, in my view. Yeah. I, I've been taking some questions that are coming in from, from uh, the audience that, that, that's watching the live streams. So thank you for that. I'm also going to make a, a very belated appeal, uh, and, and, and I apologize for not doing it earlier. Uh, there is a hashtag, hashtag economic transformation, um, I think. Uh, yeah, it is. So if you, if you could be tweeting this, uh, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, uh, and a question has come in for you, Dominic, which is, which is really the question of, of, of in Ethiopia, how does one keep that momentum going? You've seen companies such as yourself coming in, uh, but how does one kind of then crowd in further investment? What needs to happen? <sighs> Good question, because it's, it, it's, it's, to some degree, it's a bit of a revolving door. There was, there are, there's been, uh, and we talk about visions, visions of governments and what visions want to be achieved, and the Ethiopian government has been particularly excellent at promoting itself internationally. It's on the world stage, it has the conversations, it has an agenda, and it's very clear on its targets. Are the targets realistic? Um, I would like to say no, but in reality, yes. Um, they, are, they are not going to be met. Um, there is still massive internal displacement and, and civil disruption, which can breed some discontent around investors. We're making things work, and we're prepared, and we're in it for the long term. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not an investor that looks for a, for a quick win. Ethiopia, Africa is a, is a long-term strategy. And we've braced and prepared for that. But there are a number of investors, possibly too many, that will go to Africa chasing cheap labour. And I hate to say it, um, or I don't hate to say it, I will highlight the fact that on the Ethiopian Investment Commission's website for a number of months, the tagline was lowest wages in the world. So you're only going to attract certain investors with that tagline. That was in the early days of Ethiopia attracting investment. That is no longer promoted. That's no longer on the website. We didn't go there because of cheap labor. We went there because of a goer, uh, abundance of labor, and, and, a, and a country with a vision to build the garment sector. But in conversations that I've not been part of, I, I, I'm certain there have been investors that have come under potentially false pretenses or because they think things are going to be cheap. That hasn't worked for them, and they're failing. Um, and it, it's like any investment, governments will seek your money, banks will seek your money, entrepreneurs will seek your money. It's your job to ascertain what is right and what is wrong for you and what your principles are as you invest. And I feel you must invest in Africa with the right principles. Uh, and, and the evolution of principles is not to take domestic production from China, which is becoming too expensive, and putting it in Ethiopia and having Ethiopia manufacture domestic product for China. That, that is, is, it will create a lot of jobs, but it won't create a lot of value. Um, so we have a mix of investors. You have those loyal and determined um, who are in it for the long run, and I, I believe are, are making progress. But there have been a number of investors who have come and been burnt quite quickly, and I would blame them for being burnt. I wouldn't blame the Ethiopians or the Ethiopian government. Ethiopia is a very poor country. It has cholera. It has uh, over a million internally displaced people. Things aren't going to be easy. You know, there's no, there's no surprises there. Um, so, and I sit in the rooms with people like Unilever and Procter and Gamble who put their hands up complaining. Look, they're a lot bigger, they're a lot richer than any of us in this room. So if I can get it done, they can get it done too. Um, it's an encouraging spirit. Um, let's open this up to the floor. Um, okay, and I see, gosh, okay. Uh, so question, uh, uh, should, we take, should we take them in small bunches, like two or three at a time? What, what, what would you like, Dirk? Uh, to to, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's take them in, in two or three. So there we go. And, and if you could just introduce yourself, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sheila Page. Oh, yeah. I wondered, particularly for taking your, uh, Jonathan, 50-year perspective, what you can say about what the strategies are for killing off ex-winners. Uh, what, what conditions you need to make sure that once a 
sector ceases to be the the place to go, you get rid of it. Uh, Dirk mentioned Mauritius's trans transition from sugar to textiles to services, which was done in effect by internalizing it, or to put it less politely, the same people got the same profits. Uh, what other strategies are there? And is there any, uh, are there any general rules of what you need to do to either compensate losers or uh, suppress them? Great, thank you. And could we take another question also in the front here, second row? Uh, uh, did I see it? Was there a hand here? Oh, You mentioned that uh, you look at uh, the various aspects of the business uh, conforming to human rights uh, affecting the whole society. Uh, you mentioned Sri Lanka. Well, I, I, I am sorry I am <laughs> concerned on that one. Uh, EU GSP plus is granted to Sri Lanka right. while uh, the North uh, uh, has been under the army rule for the last 10 years. The utter human rights violations. I hope that is not happening in African countries. Uh, who will take a question? The EU or any um, provider of business? Uh, the questions on human rights. Thank you. And there was a question further back. I'm going to take one right towards the back. Uh, hand high in the air. There we go. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John Gibb, uh, and I'm retired, but I've worked in development. There are two things. One is under conditions of growth or conditions for growth. Um, I haven't heard anybody talk about good governance. And by good governance, I suppose in summary, I mean um, accountability, transparency, and adherence to the rule of law. And I would suspect that if you, if you compare on a continent-wide basis, that Africa is, is falling well behind Asia and Latin America. So that's one thing to consider. And I think, again, we're looking forward. Um, accelerating economic transformation in Africa. There isn't an awful lot of time to do this, I don't think. And there are a number of strategic challenges um, around um, hydrocarbons, use of coal, which are still quite major uh, earners of foreign exchange uh, on the African continent, uh, environment degradation, and of course climate change, and we've talked quite a lot about airlines. So I'd be interested to know how these things are factored into economic planning at country level and the extent to which, say, the African Union is, or the African Development Bank are thinking about these things. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So, 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 so let's turn back to the panel and I suppose uh, question one of, of sort of how, how do you get rid of, 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 of zombies or, or, or compensate lo losers? And, uh, uh, Raji, do you, do, you want, do you want to pick that one up or, or Kartik? Uh, uh, I'll try. That's an extremely difficult <laughs> question to, to respond to. Um, I mean, I, I just had one thought came to my mind when, we were, when you were asking that, which is that um, th there are ways in which you can develop industrial policy up front that, um, so for example, sunset clauses and in, in sort of incentives, right? That, that, that's one mechanism that you can use to, to ensure that there's not this sort of um, ongoing, unlimited sort of subsidy that's going to firms even if they're not performing, right? So um, there, there are some things that you can do up front to try to address that issue. But um, again, we come back sort of to the politics there. Once firms get entrenched, it's very difficult to sort of, um, you know, get them out of that position. So I, I don't have any easy answers there. But, um, but I, I think one thing to say is that it's important to sort of, as, as best as possible, try to anticipate up front how... how you know, at least in the short term, things might evolve so that you can um, craft policies in a way that don't sort of enable firms to entrench themselves without actually del delivering on the on the objectives that you've set out. Great. I, I, I suppose the human rights question, I suppose, is, is, is it, and, and, and whether it should be tr tied to trade policy. Uh, I, I mean, you, you mean, do you, do you have any views as to, as to how, you know, sort of how, how important uh, that conversation is and, and whether it's uh, 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 the conversation that uh, people should be having. Well, I think it is, and it's, it's linked to the, the gentleman's question about governance, really. And I think um, creating an enabling environment, when we talk about an enabling environment for business, it should be 
with those um, very v v uh, valid values in mind as well. And, 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 but it's the government's responsibility, yes, but it is also the government's responsibility to punish the businesses that are not um, in line with the values. Because you'll be surprised, some of the huge um, companies, you mentioned some of them, I'm not saying um, PNG are part of the problem, but what we've seen is the power of the big corporations almost swallow governments. That's, that's a reality. And, and, and that's why I said in, in my initial presentation, at, oftentimes we, we, we look at the government that is dealing with you know, creating, uh, growing the tax base, creating employment, um, you know, resolving conflict. And, and at the same time, the, it could just be that there's just only one major investor that is in the country that is at least creating the employment, and you close the eyes, um, just, just so that, you know, there's <laughs> life that's happening. So, uh, you know, we have to be realistic, because the, the, the and, you know, sitting in London sometimes, you, you, you get a sense of unrealism um, when it comes to pointing the finger at governments. Because, in essence, you should point the finger at the, 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 the so-called investors. Because government doesn't just create the issues by themselves. And so if, if we are serious about starting to resolve some of these issues of governance, we need to look everywhere and, and assist these governments to implement some of the laws that are there, uh, only that the, the, the ones that need to be punished are too powerful. So, so I'm not discounting the problem. I'm just being realistic in, in how to deal with the issue. Uh, if I may, yes. uh, on the point of, um, so I think the government, the governance point, I, I'm, I totally agree. I mean, it should be part of the attraction, the creating an enabling environment uh, that includes governance. On your second point of, of in essence, green growth um, and, and dealing with issues of the airlines and the pollute polluters. I think I personally struggle with that because, you know, and I'm a conservationist, but sometimes, again, being re realistic, you look at some of the countries that have huge deposits of coal, for example, and could only look at that as, as one avenue for growth. And then you have someone in London, some organizations in London saying, don't, don't go that route, yet Right here, coal is still being used. I think, again, realism. You know, Africa should not be, it, it's not, um, Africa operates in an environment that we all live in. And if we are really talking about developing Africa, we need to face the same issues, the same realities that the world is faced with. When we talk about airlines in Africa, how many are they, honestly? To, 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 to create such a, such a challenge. And then and, and we see the, the kind of airlines that are landing in, in European countries or in America. We have got to be realistic. Where, where I agree with you is the growth in Africa needs a mixture of, if you look at energy, for example, we cannot just say, you know, go, go on and exhaust your coal deposits. But surely, if we are interested in the growth of Africa, coal will have to be a part of the solution. Not only it, let's include wind and solar and everything in between, but you cannot <laughs> ignore coal just because it's Africa. Africa is not polluting as we speak. But if Africa needs to say, let's increase our, uh, uh, our growth, by perhaps, you know, playing a 0.1% increase in pollution, but let everybody else reduce it so we create a balance. I think we need realism as we move forward, and we look to think tanks to, to educate all, um, all audiences on, on this particular issue. Let's take another, an, another round of questions. Uh, there was a hand up first towards the middle. Uh, Sorry, so uh, <laughs> that's not very helpful. Um, 
There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is more on um, inclusive investment. Um, so more so, what can be done to support entrepreneurs from, so homegrown entrepreneurship, as well as entre entrepreneurship from the diaspora, who have the concepts but do not have the finance to move beyond the concept stage? Um, so my question is um, to Her Excellency if, or anyone else who could answer that question. How to get something off the ground. Next question, uh, again, towards the... There we go. Thank you. Um, Liz May from Tradecraft. Um, we've been talking a lot about economic transformation, um, and I, I'm a little bit unclear. I, th I think we keep slipping into talking just generally about industrialization and se sectors. So I'd like to ask the panel, panel, what does economic transformation, those specific words, mean to you? And how is it different? What, what are the... What are the additional qualities that you see in something that's called economic transformation as opposed to what we used to know as industrialization? Great. And I've ignored the, the sort of back left. So if there's a, if there's a person who has a, a hand back left who has not spoken. Uh, my name is Mark Plant from the Center for Global Development. I'm wondering what you think of whether uh, official development systems, ODA, is a net contributor or a detractor from uh, economic transformation? Thank you. Okay, so, 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 so Dirk, I'm, I'm going th to throw the first one to you and, and we can uh, ask the rest of the panel at least the second question to you. Uh, w w what does economic transformation look like? What's different or special? Um, yeah, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, and we had some debate on it actually this morning as well. I think... Um, the way I would define economic transformation is uh, broad-based productivity change through structural transformation mo and structural change moving from one sector to another sector. So sectors that go uh, have low productivity, sectors that have higher productivity, but also within sector productivity change. And that's, of course, what we're talking about now a lot. And I also think that the original Lewis interpretation of transformation, which was going from the sort of subsistence sector to the modern sector, isn't necessarily only the right description now because, of course, you, within a sector, you also have modern and uh, less modern uh, parts as well. So we need to look very much within sector uh, change a lot. Um, but I think that in, um, the, one of the challenges that, that Africa has faced is the lack of industrialization. And I think that if you look at other countries, they have, uh, have industrialized more. Yes, there's the premature deindustrialization point that's being, uh, being raised. So it's more difficult to break into manufacturing. It's more difficult to, um, uh, to get it to a higher level. Um, but I think the, the Africa level is so low at the moment that I think there must be uh, uh, quite a big increase. So I think that industrialization is, is a big story in, uh, in, in economic transformation. It's not the only thing. And of course, things are related it. So, uh, agri business will depend on uh, uh, on agriculture. Uh, the services sectors will also have to feed uh, the, um, or, or have to to, to, to provide uh, answers for for industrialization. So, um, th th they are very much uh, interlinked. But I think it's um, uh, it's broad based, and I think when done well. Um, so when you don't do it uh, uh, same as what it used to be, like uh, growth uh, based on natural resources and so on. Um, you can also uh, be greener, you can do it better, you can be uh, better planning in urban, urban areas, uh, for example, where you, you, you do it more in a more connected way rather than dispersed way. You can also base it on uh, much more on renewable energies, which are perhaps now uh, beginning to be more pr uh, uh, um, uh, cheaper. Than, than some of the traditional uh, uh, energy sources as well. So I think that, that actually there's quite a link between economic transformation and um, social change, uh, sort of the things that, um, that Dominic was talking about, uh, helping people, um, but also environmental change as well. And I think there, uh, so, so it, it does mean doing something different, diversifying and not doing uh, much of the same uh, so relying on relatively high growth rates in African countries, but not really transforming and being employment rich or or uh, or having a big poverty reducing effect. So we look, you, you look at a different type of, of growth. Uh, um, is there any disagreement uh, with, with, with Dirk's uh, summation of that? Uh, let's move uh, ODA. I know we, we sort of touched on this slightly earlier, but but uh, succinctly, is is ODA uh, helping or hurting? Um, uh, Kartik Raji. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. 
um, <laughs> and a controversial one. I think with, with any kind of assistance, it needs to be well thought through, has to align with the priorities of countries, and then of course is beneficial. Um, but to, to pick it up, there are examples where it's gone wrong, examples where it has benefited as well. So I, I would hesitate to say, you know, take, say, no, it's wrong, or yes, it's right. Okay. Yes, so I think we can agree that it has to be well thought through and aligned with the priorities of the different countries. Dominic, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw a question to you. There, there was another one that came in uh, online and, and that links in with this sort of how does one get started, sort of A, and I'm going to ask you to be brief on that, and B, uh, what advice would you give to others who are, who are wanting to follow you into these markets? What's the, the, the one thing that you wish you'd known? Uh, on the first one, I mean, it's, it's a challenging question. Although we see entrepreneurs as individuals out there driving the charge, I had a team of over 3,000 people in Sri Lanka supporting me. Um, so we are a multinational business with hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. We didn't just turn up and put our flag in the ground and hope it, it worked. Um, so it, it is difficult for me to take it. As a, we were entrepreneurial in spirit, but we were a major, we were a major organization before we came to, to uh, East Africa. And challenges. Well, I didn't realise that starch, for example, didn't have a tax code in Ethiopia and you need starch to iron goods in garment factories. Um, the, these are the, the little things that can really slow your production up. The, the big challenges, the, the infrastructure that is put in place by the Ethiopian and Kenyan governments, and I'm sure the same goes for in Rwanda, they're very slick. They're very much focused on taking down barriers to trade and reducing friction. And a lot of credit also has to be given to the likes of Frank from Trademark East Africa, who has enabled the cost per mile on transport to come down significantly. So the big issues have often been thought about way ahead by the likes of uh, the ODI and overseas development assistance. And we turned up in a beautiful economic uh, zone where we were able to start doing business. So we were facilitated in, in, in a major way. And those big challenges have been brought, brought through. Where it's really coming home to rest is what was forgotten whilst we focused on those big challenges. So in Hawassa at the moment, there's a cholera outbreak. There's a brand new prison, but there isn't any brand new hospitals. When you build an economic zone which goes to employ 60,000 people, ideally you want to put some houses, some sewage, and some hospitals in place. What do we have now? We have people dying and a lot of, lot of ill people and potentially not coming to work, jeopardising the big strategies that were thought about, but also jeopardising the investors. So there's so much still to be learned through, through, through the process, and we as an organisation have to be robust and help, help uh, the community and, 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 and governments to, to do that. Dirk? Please come in, because I think this is just the process of, of, of transformation. Uh, it takes time to get zones working. Uh, we know that from Ireland and Singapore, it didn't take five years. It, take, it took uh, 20 years to, to get it going and to get the linkages built as well. Um, so we need to hear this and we need to think, well, Ethiopia did get something right. It did move the, uh, the share of, of, of manufacturing in GDP from 2 to 5, 5%, which is great given the rest of Africa is going down and it's going up. Um, and they have doubled the garments exports uh, as well, but there are lots of challenges out there. And this is time. Uh, this takes time. This process needs to be f facilitated, uh, and we need to be there to 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 help to help that. The, the, cha the challenge, Dirk, is that, and a gentleman in the audience also raised this: we don't have much time. And Sorry? secondly, we're going from twenty million dollars of exports to eighty million dollars of exports. This is not shifting the barometer for economic transformation mm -hmm. in uh, the speed that we need and the change that we need and there's a number of I think the context for a number of your questions doing it in the right yeah. way is it being done in the right way um, and I think everyone I've met has put their best foot forward and wants to make the change happen in the right way but things keep slipping through the gaps and that's going to come to the detriment of the of the change and at the yeah. speed that we need it I'm talking to doing yeah. don't, don't go away because what, what I'm going to do instead of me summing up what I'm going to so we've got three minutes. I'm going to be strict on time. I'm going to say to you, let, let, let's make this uh, 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 sort of action-oriented. If I gave you a superpower for a day and you could change one thing that would, that would move the needle on this, mm -hmm. what is that one thing you would change and you're each going to get a turn? So, Dirk, you're, you're, the clock is ticking. Now. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so one thing we estimated that in uh, East Africa, 
uh, needs to uh, create a lot of jobs just to keep up with demographic challenges. So by 2030, it needs to create, uh, I don't know how many million jobs. We translate it into numbers of people uh, it needs to, uh, of jobs it needs to create each day, additional, additionally, so it already creates a number, yeah. but additionally. And we, ca we got to 8,000 jobs a day that it needs to create. Well, that's about uh, one hella plant a day it needs to create. That's a hell of a lot of a job <laughs> to do. So that's something, if I were a superpower, I would try and see whether I can, I can, I can help and, and, and do that and work with investors. Right. What is the one, one thing that you would change, whether policies, whatever? Uh, empower and educate the people. Um, I would support him, um, integration. Because one thing we didn't talk about in Africa is Africa itself is a market. Mm. So if we could just get to a point of trading more with each other, that would substantially um, grow all of our economies. So make the free trade agreement work. Yes. Great. Next. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I would uh, get uh, government to, to focus and be able to respond in a timely way to the things that Dominic was saying, to these very sort of specific things that can potentially make or break the, the success in, of an investment. And, and that I think that would potentially have knock-on effects for sort of developing a reputation for countries as, as being good investment de destinations and so on. Um, yeah, visionary leadership with clear focus on the value of private sector to create the jobs that's required for these countries to grow. And I have been focused. The, the, the one thing that I could that I could do and, and, and have have the, have the power to do is to finish on time. It is now two twenty nine, uh, and that's now two thirty. I'm going to ask you to, to to join me in thanking the panelists for a, a very frank and insightful set of conversations. So thank you all.